Welcome, low ego action heroes. I'm Debbie Levitt from DeltaCX.com. We're a full service CX and UX consultancy, and welcome to the Friday stream, April 22 of 2022, so it says. And this is Practicing Critical Thinking, where we take a look at the things that you've sent in, and we break them into a million pieces and see what we think. And uh, today, since I got so many complaints about my lighting on Tuesday, today I am operated by the sun. So, this is the sun and the light behind me and so sorry about the green screen being a little bit fuzzy but this is the sun hello Prajot and madalina good evening <laughs> the new lighting is the sun i didn't fix the lighting yet <laughs> that's the sun and the the light behind me if i turn off the light behind me i tend to look a little weirder hold on, hold on. yeah and my green screen doesn't green out as well so Anyway, still have to fix the lighting, but thanks to everybody joining. Hello, Ian, who welcomes the sun. Um, so let's take a look at what you sent in. We didn't get a lot of stuff this week. And of course, if you would like to send something in, you can find that link at deltacx.com slash links. And you'll just check for the part that says uh, the practice critical thinking stream. Hey, Jen, it's good to see you. Hey, Ashish. Um, and what else can I tell you? Please remember to subscribe. Our um, subscribership has been jumping up lately, and I know it's because of all of you, and you've been telling three friends about this channel. I'm sure you are. Yeah, the green screen is fuzzier when I turn off the back. It's still a little fuzzy over here uh, and makes my hand a little green and fuzzy, but I will fix the lighting. I also want to let y'all in on an early secret. I am planning a big concentric conference this year. It's going to be the whole week of October 17. So I just want you to kind of pencil out your calendar uh, on the, the week of October 17. We're not ready to announce anything, but I've got to tell you something big is coming. We have uh, so many wonderful people who've agreed to do sessions and workshops. Um, it will be paid, but it will be uh, what I call my DEI uh, payment plan, which is a higher number when work is paying and a low number if you are paying. Hello, Ilaria. All right, so now that that's been said, and don't forget to tell people to subscribe, let me jump over to my screen and we'll take a look at the things that everyone sent in. There were only five or six things this week, so um, won't be too much stuff, but let's see. Okay, good. So you can see uh, me and the chat room and the optional tip jar. Oh, the optional tip jar reminds me to thank all of the low ego action heroes who are donating some money to the channel every month uh, through the YouTube join membership thingy. Uh, that's certainly optional, but always appreciated. And in fact, today I got my new shipment of chocolate chips. So thanks to all of you who keep me rolling in uh, very dark chocolate chips. So thank you. I should have brought the bag. Hold on. I'll go get, the, I'll get the bag at the end. Oh, my boyfriend's going to bring over the bag. Thanks, honey. It's in the armoire. Um, so thanks to all of you for keeping me in chocolate chips. Hashtag not sponsored. Okay, so uh, some of you, somebody sent today uh, Sumo Chatterjee, who I don't know. And Sumo says, yesterday Zoom announced a digital whiteboard called Whiteboard. One week ago, Box announced a digital whiteboard called Canvas. Thank you. My boyfriend wants me to show you the chocolate chips. Yes, this is the, uh, this, this, you could work out with it. This is the two and a half kilogram bag, five and a half pounds. Uh, 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 a little ab workout there. Uh, this is 80% Calibo. I am a little bit of a chocolate snob. Calibo is C-A-L-L-E-B-A-U-P. Thank you, honey. Uh, hashtag not sponsored. Obviously, I paid for that. They don't pay me. Um, I became a chocolate snob in 1998. Story for another time. Uh, hi, Ader. Um, okay, so, so back to this thing. This guy says, one week ago, Box announced a digital whiteboard called Canvas. Two weeks ago, ClickUp announced a digital whiteboard called Whiteboard. One year ago, Figma announced a digital whiteboard called FigJam. Look at the photo below. 
Can you tell the difference? Now you now imagine your Miro. What are you thinking right now? How do you differentiate? And uh, for those of you looking at the screen, uh, there are screenshots of what the different whiteboards are like in the different systems. And I think what he's saying is maybe people won't need Miro if they are using uh, Canvas inside of Box, FigJam inside of Figma, whiteboard inside of Zoom. Miro is obviously just a direct, com well, he, Miro. Uh, Miro and Mural are their own things and then click up. Now, meanwhile, I'm a paid customer of Miro, hashtag not sponsored, and I notice that they're adding more and more features related to meetings. So obviously these things are kind of converging. Um, <laughs> Jenna says, woo, chocolate. Ada says, I'm thinking critically about that bag of chocolate. Yeah, it is delicious. And thanks to all of you for sponsoring it. Um, so yeah, I am a Miro fan. And you know, I don't know if you know this, but Google even has their own whiteboard. And I think it's called Jamboard. I haven't used it. So the reality is that there's lots of whiteboard options out there. And it's just a matter of which one you prefer to use and why. Um, uh, David says, I'm worried about the unfathomable Figma euphoria <laughs> if I am Miro, not much anything else. Yeah, you know, um, I tend to feel like Figma is uh, has the potential to go the way of systems before it, like OmniGraffle and Sketch. You know, Sketch is still warm, but not as hot as it used to be, and there will be something next. So I think you have to pick whatever works for you. And in reality, now so many of these tools have integrations that, you know, you can use Miro, I think, with Zoom, and you can use Miro with this and that. You can use Miro with Monday.com, which again, not sponsored. I'm a big fan of Monday.com. I pay them, they don't pay me. Um, so nowadays there are integrations. So I feel like, you know, if you're choosing Zoom, choose it because it's the best Zoom, not because it has a whiteboard, because you can always do a Miro whiteboard. Um, choose Figma because it's the best Figma, not because it's got a whiteboard. So I, I think that while it's interesting to try to make these systems more all in one, um, I feel like I would still rather pick the tool that's the best for what it is. Like Miro is the best whiteboard. Axure for me is going to be the best UX design tool. Like I don't need them to all be each other. Um, I'm old enough to remember the Saturday Night Live sketch that says, no, it's a floor wax and a dessert topping. You know, not everything has to be everything, just doesn't. Oh no, one of you is trying to send a reaction request right now. I can't put that up on the board, you're too late. It'll have to be, no, not another Andy bud, come on. We shouldn't even be looking at him and giving him attention. Is that you, Shweta? She's obsessed, I think. Um, no, we'll hold Andy Bud for next week. He's too depressing, and I don't even know why we give him attention. Hi, Steph. Um, so, yeah, interesting stuff. You know, how do you differentiate? I think you just have to be the best whiteboard tool you can be and hope that these other ones are still Fisher Price. Uh, that's my thoughts. I know about all of you. Um, okay, someone sent this to me and said, don't bug me. It was free. I'm going to do it. So this says UX UI design a thon, which I assume is some sort of hackathon from Avocadomy, which is a strange name, unless you like avocados. And basically it says, you're going to be in groups of two to design a website or an app solving a problem in the theme of FinTech, Web3, or Metaverse. This is already buzzword bingo. I, d I don't have a particular graphic for buzzword bingo. I'll just uh, set off the confetti. That's a lot of buzzwords. A design prompt will be given out on May 16th for each theme, but that's the day that this starts. You have one week. It's virtual over Zoom and it's free. And then you can attend a speaker series to further your skills. There's a lot going on here. So it's a week long hackathon, but it's also a free conference. I'm not sure. Again, it's a floor wax and a dessert topping. Um, you should do this if you are transitioning in, if you have no experience or less than one year, if you're a college student with an interest and you can get cash prizes if you're in a certain place. If you cannot get a cash prize, you'll get their course for free. And again, I, I'm not sure their course is any good, but you know, that's that. And otherwise they're giving you cash. 
Um, hey, if you can win and get the cash, that's fine. Um, I always wish these things told you how they're going to judge you. And if you're going to be attending talks while this is going on, I don't understand what the talks are. Um, blurb number one, blurb number two. You have to share your design-a-thon on your social media for a chance to win an iPad Air and Apple Pencil. Does anybody... Okay, whatever, whatever. Become a speaker and to become a sponsor. This is just happening in weeks and they don't have speakers. Where's the speakers? Okay, so this is a little weird. Madalena says they're missing crypto. Udipta says, been seeing the referral rinks of this hackathon spammed across Discord. Yeah, well, it looks like the more you spam it, the more you might be able to win an iPad. So, so there's that. Um, so again, I remind people that you really can't put a hackathon in your portfolio because it's just hours or days of you guessing at something and it's not really a UX process. There's nothing about the hackathon that looks like this. There really isn't design. Uh, they're usually there and there's not testing. So basically it's just Hey, I have an idea. Hey, look, I sketched it out or designed it or made a website or whatever. Madalena says, get the cash prize and buy Debbie's course. Well, considering my course is as low as $17, I hope if you do win the prize, you will spend it on, you know, chocolate chips or something better because my courses are, are priced to be affordable. Um, so ultimately, I think this is a big plug for Avocadomy, and, and that's smart marketing. I can't complain about that, but it's not a, a course that I would recommend. And if you can win the cash, good for you. I hope you will. And if you win the cash and you're a friend of the show, I hope you'll tell us. Um, we'll be very proud of you. Uh, okay, someone sent in, and I can swear we've looked at this before, but it's back. Um, SCAD, uh, which is a, a college, um, is, uh, evidently has a bachelor's degree in UX design. And I guess someone wanted to know what I thought of this, even though I've had multiple shows on how to tell for yourself if, uh, a program is any good. Uh, when I first glanced at this, I thought that this was probably not a BFA in UX design. This looks like it's just a BFA. Um, because you have to start with drawing, which I'm terrible at. I would fail out of school right there. Design one, drawing two, color theory, and drawing for design, whatever that means. So first of all, this sounds definitely very visual design, graphic design heavy. That doesn't mean it's bad. SCAD is very well respected, even though I don't know much about it. But... Um, it doesn't sound like UX design. So now you move into more, co more courses, anthropology, computer science, ideas, visual culture, critical concepts in literature, algorithm design, computer aided product design, and math 240 logic. You're going to learn two and 3D digital renderings. This sounds, uh, I know what y'all are thinking right now, but this sounds like, oh my God, take everything we have left in the refrigerator and put it in the blender and I'm just going to drink it. Like this sounds like uh, you need to take English and math and ideas and visual culture and anthropology and two and 3D modeling. It's like, holy cats, you know, you're going to end up knowing a little about a lot. Um, then there's more curriculum, typography, visual design, rapid prototyping. Let's see how they suggest you do this. CAD software. Mm -mm -mm. Not Axur, not Framer, not even Figma, CAD. So that is some sort of industrial design modeling. Steph says 3D rendering, blender, pun intended. No, I'm not that smart. I didn't even think of that. Thank you, Steph. Um, contextual research methods, programming, no thank you, graphic design media management, HCI, interactive product design. Would you like to learn programming or physical computing? I think we're done here. Um, this sounds like a very difficult and grueling bachelor's degree that, I, and I'm not really sure what it's going to prepare you for. There is so much going on here. You're going to come out of this again, I feel, knowing a little 
about a lot. And I'd rather see you come out of a bachelor's or master's degree knowing a lot about more specialized areas. That's my personal opinion. Tom McCormack says, Debbie's metaphor game never disappoints. Thank you, Tom. Um, Steph says, all that 90 hours. Woo. Yeah, it's, uh, it definitely feels like the, um, the fast version. So, so yeah, I, I would have to say I don't approve here. Um, I think there are too many things that might not be UX design for this to be a good bachelor's in UX design. There was 3D modeling, there was CAD, there's coding, there's um, visual and graphic design. And it's not that these are bad things to learn. It's just when I think about what I do day to day, I don't need most of these. So maybe you don't either, unless you specifically wanted to go into that kind of area. Um, Prajot says, do you have any comments on the HCDE program at University of Washington? Yes. I respected that program a lot until someone told me they recently changed it to be more about design thinking. So if it is about design thinking, I do not respect it and do not recommend it. But if it's about proper HCI, uh, HCD, UCD, then I'm probably for it. But if it's true that they're changing it to be more about design thinking, then no thank you. You definitely don't need a master's degree in design thinking, especially since the last seven definitions someone gave me of design thinking, it was, you're already doing it. All right, let's move on. This one's fun and it's going to take a while to click through. It is definitely not a four minute story, but we'll try to go through it fast. Uh, this is growth.design. They seem to offer courses. I think we looked at them last year and we kind of couldn't tell if it was good or not. We thought some of the curriculum looked interesting. We couldn't figure out who these guys were. Um, so, so they got kind of a two or three dogs. Um, but what they've got here is really cute and really well done. So, you know, all courses aside, I can't speak to their courses. This is a really cute page with a really cute story and I like the way they've done it. So I just have to press the arrows on my keyboard to go through this. And this guy talks about going to his bank. He had problems with his account and an employee helped him. And then they're going to ask you to do a survey because it's going to evaluate my performance as an employee. Sure thing. And then when he gets a uh, mail and it's got a survey, it's ends up being an NPS, which of course doesn't typically ask how happy were you with this particular employee. It asks, would you rate our bank to somebody else? And he kind of points out like, wait a minute, is this the right survey? Because I thought I was going to be responding to the, the experience with the employee. And, um, you know, I, he feel, he felt like the email was very boring and, um, dry for, and he says, there's five big problems with this survey email. Can you spot them? Uh, first of all, he says the email is freezing cold. We want your feedback survey. How likely would you be to recommend the bank to a friend or family member? overused question. And he says, in fact, I think I get one of these a week. I'm just so used to archiving them because, you know, bleh, MPS. And he's, and then he says, Hey, psychology moment here, information filtering. There's so much information that you just have to kind of filter your world and put, put certain things into trash piles. So I thought this was again, really nice, uh, visual representation and a nice teaching moment. So maybe their course, if their course is like this, maybe it's not so bad, but I haven't tried it. And then he says, okay, number two, imagine if James spoke to me like this, like, is this email written the way a customer would, a, a worker would talk to a customer, dear valued customer? No, chances are people wouldn't say that. So if people wouldn't say that, why are we writing stuff this way? He sounds like a weird corporate robot, right? James would probably say, how can we improve? How was your experience? So he's got a good point there too. He says, third, even if I wanted to answer, what am I rating? Because the survey says you dealt with our staff and your overall experience banking with us. So now the question is, what are you even rating? Elvina says, hi, Debbie, what is this course? So this technically isn't a course. This is growth.design slash case dash studies dash NPS 
I'm sorry, slash NPS dash surveys. And it's just them telling a story about uh, how NPS surveys are kind of crappy. And they are. Uh, I'm not for them. So, um, so basically now we're confused. What am I really rating or responding to? What if I hate the bank, but I liked dealing with the support rep? How do I, you know, do I average it? What do I do? And is that going to penalize the employee? And of course, now they're dropping in another teaching moment, which is, hey, this could be a double barreled question. We've asked you two questions at the same time, and that's going to be difficult. Madalena said, I sent this one to my manager. It hit the spot. Good job, Madalena. Fourth, if you read carefully, this question's not even about rating my current experience. It's how like, you know, would I be the bank's ambassador in the future? And that's something I say about NPS all the time is that it doesn't really rate satisfaction or loyalty, even though it's often treated as a measurement of satisfaction or loyalty. It measures a person's, um, prediction that they might recommend you in the future. We don't even know if they've already recommended you. And that, uh, and, and I just visited the bank. So this all seems like a bit of a stretch. And again, teaching moment, NPS can be inaccurate. People don't understand it. There's inaccuracies. It's not about customer loyalty or growth. Um, and it's just all flawed. NPS has a lot of flaws, which I agree with. Finally, this email is a real pain. Who wants to read walls of text? He's totally right. You know, they could have put any of the scoring at the front and then put some text after it. Or again, th there's many ways they could have done it. He says, and if my thumb can cover four different answers, you're in trouble. We all know about having bigger tappable areas. Marisol says, can you share the link? Yeah, I'll copy and paste it into YouTube. Hold on. But you also should be able to see it at the top of my screen, though I know depending upon what device you're looking at, this may be very small. Um, so again, I am not vouching for these people's courses, but this was certainly a fun walkthrough with some nice teaching moments. And again, another teaching moment, Hicks Law. Now again, not, not everybody agrees with Hicks Law, but um, ultimately we know that the fewer choices people make, sometimes the less cognitive load and the easier it is for them. So here NPS has 11 choices, and do people really feel that granularly about stuff versus say a five point scale. Pragiot says, this was interesting. Yeah, thanks to the person who sent this in. You know, these are all sent in anonymously at deltacx.com slash link. So I don't know who sent it in, but thank you. I hadn't seen this and this is fun. Um, he says, well, first I wanted to help James, but now I just feel like a data point on a faceless corporation. Sorry, James. The truth is they would get much better results if they just sent a really simple, and here they're saying, you know, what about a three point survey? James was bad, okay, or good. And that it's really clear that you're rating the experience you just had with Dan versus an overall impression of the bank or, or something like that. And, uh, and he's totally right. Um, so, hey, the subject line is relevant. Um, that's, uh, that's part of good content design. That's part of good information architecture. Hi, I'm James's manager. This is human. Uh, hey, can I get your feedback? Hey, just tap it. And your feedback is confidential. Um, Madalena said, I was watching an episode of the Romanian Shark Tank and a participant was asked, how will you monitor the quality of your eclairs over time? And the contestant said, oh, that's easy. I'll use NPS. Ah. Ada says, I got a lame NPS like this where a chatbot was like, how likely would you recommend my service to a friend? What, who on earth recommends a chatbot to a friend? Very true. So... Um, there you go. So, um, yeah. And then of course, a nice open text field for any commentary you have. Companies are too obsessed with NPS. It's also a spam nightmare. And again, another teachable moment. So do you want to be another NPS survey in the trash or do you really want to collect actionable feedback? And then of course they're pushing whatever is their customer survey checklist and probably their course. So 
yeah, would you like to see more of their case studies? So well done to growth.design. I thought that was engaging. I thought that was fun. I thought it had some nice teachable moments. I thought it really made things very relevant to uh, user experiences, customer experiences, and some of the critical thinking and design that should go into that. So uh, yeah, so good for them. This, this looks good and it makes me, it definitely succeeds in making me curious about what their, uh, what their courses are like. So, you know, great marketing for, for them. Um, but again, I can't necessarily recommend their course. I haven't taken it, but it definitely would make me curious and interested and, and want to know more since this felt like a, a fun and, and engaging teaching experience. Steph says the worst is when people insist on having NPS on enterprise internal tools. Would you recommend your tool to your friends? Well, my friends don't work here. So what is this question? Yeah, very true. Good point. Um, we've got two more to go here and I'm going to reorder them, uh, cause one is spicier than another. Oops. I have accidentally reordered them straight into hell. Hold on. Can I get this back here? Sort of. Okay. So we'll start with Erica Hall and then we'll go to Matthew. So Erica Hall, uh, earlier this week wrote, Brainstorm questions with your team. Don't brainstorm ideas. Brainstorming questions enhances collaboration and learning. Brainstorming ideas is anti-collaborative because everybody wants their personal idea to win. Uh, brainstorm questions, identify the most important goal or decision, take suggestions for all the questions. Oh, by the way, I'm going to ask Madalena, what fallacy is she using here? Cause I know what's coming and I bet Madalena does. Who knows what fallacy she's using here? Um, sort them bonus round, blah, blah, blah. So I think that, um, meeting with coworkers, stakeholders, other people, teammates, and learning about questions and finding out what people are assuming or guessing or don't know or wish they knew or need clarified um, is really good. You don't even need to hold a meeting. Uh, at my current consulting job, we've just been sending out a mural or Miro board and saying, Hey, uh, on your own time, here's your deadline by this date and time, make sure you've put up all your sticky notes on what your questions, assumptions, um, other things like that are. So sure, definitely collect questions, assumptions, guesses, knowledge gaps from your team. Um, you can have it as a brainstorming session or like we're doing, you can send it out as an asynchronous, uh, board. Um, but. I would say there is a logical fallacy or argument fallacy being committed here. And that is, I usually call, I know it's not the right name for it. I usually call it the fallacy of, a, of the false choice. I think it's a choice fallacy where it basically sounds like, well, there's only one or the other, either you're brainstorming questions with your team or you're brainstorming ideas. So do this, don't do this. And I think that, uh, there's also kind of a, a bit of a cherry picking fallacy happening here as well, where it says, well, brainstorming questions will enhance collaboration, but brainstorming ideas is anti-collaborative because everyone wants their idea to win. Well, hold on a second. As that is written, I don't, uh, I don't agree with it because brainstorming the ideas itself, like for example, could you brainstorm ideas and not have voting? and not have a winner. So, okay, critical thinking, everybody come on this, this journey with me. We could have a brainstorming session with people and have no voting. That means there is no winner. That means we should remove whatever might skew the meeting or session or workshop because people might want their idea to in some way win. If we remove the voting and, and, or a selection of the winner or a declaration of the winner, um, or some sort of selection of the best idea, if we really just brainstorm ideas, which I do, uh, in the rare times when I run a, an ideation or brainstorming workshop, then it, it, if, if that's, if that's the premise she's sending out, then we can easily, uh, solve that. If she thinks brainstorming ideas is anti-collaborative because people want their personal idea to win, then make it collaborative by removing the winner. 
just make sure everybody is brainstorming ideas because ultimately the winner is the customer. That's what I would want to make sure people understood. If we are going to have some sort of brainstorming session or workshop, and it better not be design thinking or design sprints, y'all, well then let's just make sure we remember that the winner here is supposed to be the customer. So, um, I would say be careful of something that is written like this because it's written to set up, do this and don't do this when really you could do both. You could do neither. And you can always take something like brainstorming ideas and make it better by removing voting, removing the winner. So, um, I think she's setting up a little bit of a false premise here. Um, I'm not against her idea of brainstorming questions, but since I'm always trying to reduce or eliminate meetings, my question is, do you really need uh, a meeting to, to brainstorm questions or can it be the asynchronous board I'm doing? Prajot says something like crazy eights would be beneficial because everyone's opinion is respective and, and a, and a decision is really, is reached uh, collectively. Okay. Let's see. Crazy eights. Well, that's from design sprints. So, you know, I'm not going to love that. So what's crazy eights? Cause I don't use this shit. Each team member folds a piece of paper into eight, sketch an idea in each rectangle, and you get eight minutes. Yeah, I'd be completely against that. You know, again, I, I think that something like that is about volume or quantity of ideas, and I would rather have quality of ideas. You know, if you want to learn more about um, the uh, ideation workshop that I recommend, uh, then you would just need to find the YouTube Delta CX episode 115, which looks like this. So just search for that. And sure, I'm in a private browser, so I'm getting all of these uh, things. And this one has chaptering, so you can check and you can look for Delta CX Ideation Workshop. And I spend about 10 minutes explaining, oh, it's counting down and the music is playing. Um, so you, it's, I spend about 10 minutes explaining the type of workshop I think you can do that I think is even better than, than all of these, which is focused on, uh, ideas, not sketches. As soon as somebody is sketching, we've taught everybody, we don't need you. As soon as everybody can get together and sketch what this is going to be, why do we need UX designers? Any of them. Why have any UX designers at our company if we can get everybody together, sketch screens, vote for one we like, and make it? So, crazy eights, no thank you. Ah, oh, so delicious. Okay, um, we've got one more. And this is from Matthew. I really want to hear what everybody has to say about this one. So, this is Matthew. Um, I'm not connected with him and I don't know him very well, but he said, not sure why everyone seems to want to make UX some difficult, burdensome process with artifacts and protocols. UX is just continually asking people what they want and then trying our best to make that. Oh, Madalena, I'm sure you've got something to say about this. Madalena says, I just think brainstorming meetings are forced. People get ideas when they get ideas. They could certainly document it somewhere, but don't make people squeeze things out on Thursdays from 9 to 11. Yeah, I agree. I still feel like I have all my best ideas in the shower, and I don't want to hold a meeting there, and neither should you. Um, so, uh, luckily, some people seem to not agree with this person. You know, hey, and medicine is just diagnosing illness and treating. Let's draw an L. So uh, it looked like even though they got some good uh, clicks, it looks like a lot of people didn't agree. But I want to hear what you think. We, we've got at least 20 of you watching live right now. What do you think about this? And using your critical thinking, what do you notice in how he presents this? Anybody notice anything, any particular tactic or technique or uh, fallacy? What, what do you notice? Anything here that you notice about how he presents this? Because I notice a, a couple of things.
Madalena says, oh, we did it at the boot camp. Okay, there's that. Anybody else? I'm just waiting to see if there's any other thoughts on this. Anybody feel like joining in the critical thinking? No, just me. All right. Oh, Elvina says he's making it sound as if anyone can do it. That's very true. And so there's a few things that I notice here. And remember, we're going to put on our critical thinking hats for this one. Steph says, oh, I wrote a whole reply to him. Okay, so you're somewhere in the 72 comments. But let's put on our critical thinking hats. And I'm going to break this down in slow motion. Everyone. So first of all, it's always, uh, uh, there's always a bloodbath when you start with a universal, all or none. So always be careful when making any sort of argument or point with someone, stay away from the alls and the nuns. Everyone's doing this. Nobody does this. Everybody agrees with me. Nobody wants this. Make sure you're staying away from those because they can make the argument to me sound a little bit elementary school, uh, primary school. Um, Ader says, it's very shallow. Faye says, I rolled my eyes and kept scrolling when I saw it. Yeah, I feel you there. So first of all, stay away from universals. That's my suggestion. Now I can jokingly say, always stay away from universals. So of course, everyone always, you know, these are the things to, to uh, be careful of. It's much better to say, if, if you have a strong point and you can back it up, many people, some people, a majority of people, you know, but once you say everyone, it's really easy to poop on your argument because it's probably not everyone. Okay, so number two, who are these people making UX a difficult, burdensome process? Um, UX isn't a difficult, burdensome process. We have an absolutely lovely process called user-centered design, which I'll put up on the screen. And the great thing about it is it's got fluidity and flexibility and people who are strategic are able to pick which aspects of this we're going to do and how we're going to do them. And so it doesn't have to be difficult and burdensome, but of course that is an unfortunate uh, perception that people have about UX and why they're always trying to skimp on us and cut us shorter and shorter. So I expect to see an argument like this from someone who doesn't understand UX, like a product manager or an engineer who might not understand UX, but I'm definitely unhappy to see this coming from what should be one of our own. Um, Steph says, my answer is this is an oversimplification. And then he said, exactly, it's a simplification. Steph says, so it sounds like he just wanted attention because what he said in the comment made more sense and was more nuanced. Madalena says, FFS. Faye says, LOL. Elvina says, interesting. How many years of experience and what kind of experience in UX does he have? We'll take a look. Steph says, he's basically not happy about boot camps teaching methods and that's it. Um, Eder says, clickbait. Yeah. Um, I think the problem is that he's not talk. If he is talking about boot camps, it's unclear. And in my opinion, boot camps aren't even teaching process. Boot camps are mostly teaching tools and really surface level stuff. Like, hey, if you talk to a few people, you can make a persona. They're definitely not teaching process. So I think this whole thing is a little bit off the rails. Um, Madalena says, this is a massive oversimplification. And then he says, ooh, it's a difficult burdensome process with artifacts and protocols. I have no problems with things having artifacts and protocols. What are we supposed to do? Have no artifacts, no documentation, no wireframes, no customer mapping, because this guy doesn't like that we have artifacts. It doesn't make sense. Whenever people say, oh, UX has jargon, I go, yeah, go, go to a DevOps conference. You want to hear jargon? Every profession has its own vocabulary. We don't have to demonize it and call it jargon. Madalena says he invites people to disagree with him so people can comment and he gets engagement. Maybe, but he's not getting a lot of followers or connections on LinkedIn. That is a low number. Um, UX is asking people what they want. No, it's not. 
any of you who are watching this channel probably know UX is a lot more than getting on a phone or Zoom call with a customer and going, hey, what do you want? I'll go build that. Thanks for your time. Click. That I think we would consider that bad UX research or a bad UX process. So um, no, that doesn't look like the UX research I know and love. Uh, so I'm going to give that a no. So ultimately this is a giant no from me. And I think it has a lot of flawed argument moments that make something like this very easy to disagree with because there's, a, I don't just disagree with one piece here. I disagree with a lot of pieces here. Um, and Faye says, well, now aren't we talking about market research? It really depends. I know very often marketing thinks good research is calling people or surveying them and asking what they want and then saying, oh, look, we think people want this thing or 70% of people surveyed said they want this thing, then we should build it. It can be market research or marketing, but whether you call it market research or UX research or product market fit research, you know, to me, the name isn't important. What's important important is what are we asking people and what are we learning about their tasks and perspectives and priorities so that we can build the right thing? Because we're definitely less likely to build the right thing if we just ask somebody, what do you want? So we don't do that. And I would have to say he is off on this one. Um, I'm in a private browser, but it says here, um, that he transitioned from web design to UX design about 10 years ago. So chances are he has some sort of experience here. Uh, he doesn't look, uh, inexperienced, but, um, I, w I don't necessarily agree, agree with his, uh, perspective. So there you go. He's welcome to his perspective, but it doesn't seem to be gaining him a lot of followers and the engagement might not be positive, supportive engagement. So the question is, what do you want? Ah, the sun has gone down a little bit. I'm, I'm now heavily backlit. I look like a 1970s movie where I'm a ghost. Madalena says, I don't get why people think talking to people is easy. It's not a coffee chat. It's an exchange made with a purpose to reach the purpose. One needs a strategy and control. Yeah. Again, we've got the, the research process down here. It is not step one, talk to person, step two, make a thing. So just something for us to remember there. Um, so that is mostly the Friday show. Again, please do subscribe and tell people about the Delta CX channel, especially if they want to learn more about UX. I'm going to be doing a special show on Monday. I'm going to just riff it, but I'm getting so many questions. You know, we did a show almost two years ago about portfolio do's and don'ts. That was episode 54. So Monday's show, which will be episode 148, time has passed. I'm going to talk about uh, how to make your UX portfolio stand out, because that's the quest. One of the questions I get the most, especially from people who are new to UX and moving into UX, they want to know how to get their portfolio to stand out. So I'm going to talk about common portfolio mistakes and what kinds of portfolios stand out to me and why. Um, so come on and join in live on Monday. Uh, we're usually on at 6 30 PM Italy time because that's where I am. Madalena says, oops. I hit send too soon. Um, so, um, yeah, I hope everybody will join on Monday and it's definitely a show you're going to want to tell your friends about because we're going to be talking about portfolios. Uh oh, my stream is blipping. Uh, hopefully I'm not blipping too much. Everybody looks like I had a little internet blip. Hopefully you can hear me. But anyway, I was saying, uh, please do come on uh, Monday, tell friends about the stream, tell them just to go to YouTube, to the Delta CX channel, just wait in the channel and then we'll be live. Um, Ader says, sweet. Franchelle says, I look forward to Monday. Abby says, thank you, Debbie. I'm looking forward to it. Faye says, thanks, Debbie, with a super bicep. Um, Prajot says, thank you, Elvina. Thank you. Every thanks to all of you. Uh, you're up on the screen. Thank you for all of you. And, uh, that's what I'll do on Monday. So feel free to get those portfolio questions ready for me. Um, come live on Monday and ask those questions. But basically I'm just going to walk through the typical research portfolios and design portfolios that I see, not by showing them to you, because I don't have anybody's permission to show them to you, but I'm just going to walk through them and tell you what I normally see. And I'll tell you what looks good to me and what looks bad to me. 
So thanks to all of you and for all of your kind words here today and for not minding the, the continued strange week of lighting. I promised to fix my lighting over the weekend. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, so I'm going to play us out of here, but um, let me take a quick look at what other shows we have planned for next week. So Monday we will do Portfolio Standing Out. Tuesday will be Office Hours. Ooh, Wednesday. Oh, you've got to come on Wednesday. Wednesday we're going to have a real live breathing lawyer on the show as our special guest. Uh, he is an American lawyer, but I've asked him to give very general advice that will hopefully work around the world about for those of you who want to do freelancing, contracting, or start your own little design agency or UX business. I find so many of you are making legal mistakes. You're, you're not setting up your company correctly. You're not having the right contracts. You're not reading contracts. You're not understanding contracts. So I'm going to, I'm going to bring in a lawyer who's going to talk to us about some things we can do to not fall into common trouble that people fall into when they are trying to become freelancers, contractors, or their own little business. So thanks to, uh, thank you, Janice. Thank you, Steph. So that'll be Wednesday, the 27th of April. I hope everybody will join. Um, Thursday is Darren's chit chat. I can't make it, but you can uh, go see him. And then of course, next Friday, we'll be doing critical thinking. And then holy cats, April is over y'all. So I hope everybody has a really super weekend. Um, you know, eat your holiday chocolate, buy more chocolate if you need to. And, uh, cause you know, that's just something you need. And, um, the, it's getting dark now, so I'm going to say goodbye, but it was a great show. I had a lot of fun. Thanks to the people who sent these things in and people who joined live with their thoughts and comments. And I'll see y'all on Monday. Bye. Customer centricity as business intelligence. Visit deltacx.com to learn why we are 